Welcome to Contemporary Retirement. Contemporary Retirement is a public interest program focused on the retirement community. Every program has segments on legal, financial, and health issues affecting the retirement community. Contemporary Retirement is sponsored in part by a major grant from the Family Heritage Trust Company. Contemporary Retirement is sponsored by Family Heritage Trust Company. The Family Heritage Trust Company is an independent bank chartered trust company established by local professionals to provide fiduciary services including fee-based investment advice, trust services, retirement planning, and tax planning. The Family Heritage Trust Company is committed to client service in our communities. For more information, call the Family Heritage Trust Company at 301-631-5900. Contemporary Retirement is sponsored in part by a grant from R. Thomas Murphy & Associates, P.C. R. Thomas Murphy & Associates is one of Franklin County's leading law firms, emphasizing estate, trust, elder law, and medical assistance planning. Welcome to the Is It Legal feature on Contemporary Retirement. Is It Legal focuses on the legal issues affecting the retirement community. With me today is Tom Murphy from the R. Thomas Murphy Law Firm with offices in Waynesboro, Chambersburg, and McCollinsburg. Welcome to the show, Tom. Good morning. Tom, we spent the last several weeks talking about that number one misconception in elder law that there is nothing you can do. You have a family member or a loved one engaged in the long-term care system, it's all over it, now. Yeah, exactly. People come in every day saying that. And we are, a big part of our job is just uh, overcoming and, and fixing that myth because there's lots that can be done, especially after admission. And people come into my office every day and say, well, I decided I better just come see you just in case there's something you can do. And I said, you did yourself a heck of a favor because there is a lot that we can do. And people are just shocked. Exactly. And it's kind of exciting that we can help alleviate a lot of that worry. You can see the pressure just lift off the shoulders because they realize they're not going to go broke. You know, married couples, we can typically protect all of their assets. There's challenges here, but the opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. And so people are being told, my spouse is in the nursing home, there's nothing you can do, which is just clearly wrong. Single person cases are significantly right. more difficult, more complex, because the law is designed to protect healthy spouses, but right. it is not designed to protect inheritances for children. Well, exactly. Or uh, there is this uh, ignoring of the possibility of that single person going back to the community. So there is always a good reason to try to preserve a safety net for that individual. And so when families come in, they have a single person in the nursing home, they just say, well, I guess we're supposed to give everything to the nursing home. Well, that statement is false right on its face because in no way do you have to give everything to the nursing home. This is an application process through a government agency who does not take title to your property. They just simply tell you what you're going to have to do in order to qualify, and we help you navigate that process. Right, and so there are excellent rules out there uh, to make sure that individuals get in quality care and their bill is going to be paid without impoverishing themselves. Well, the challenge that we have here is that people are being told that it's illegal to transfer assets within five years of going in a nursing home, and that statement is just absolutely false. Exactly. We do it every day. They haven't locked us up yet. And the reality is there are really good rules, very liberal rules, for what can be protected and transferred without uh, significant problems. But one of the things that is clear in Maryland, and I'll assume so in Pennsylvania, is lay people cannot get this right anymore. You oh, know, the gosh. rule in 2006 was actually designed to boot us out of Medicaid planning and really got rid of lucky planning, which mm -hmm. did actually work prior to 2006. Sure, there was a whole different calculation of how they treated gifts and things like that. The lookbacks were there. You hear about lookbacks and all that is is a reporting thing. The problem is how they deal with those transfers. And so you can make transfers within the five-year look back. It does have some consequences, but you manage the consequences. And we just give people a rough rule of thumb. Many families can protect about half of the resources, mm -hmm. even if you did not begin a transfer strategy until after the person was in the nursing home. Exactly. And that's probably the, the most important thing is you don't want to give away your wealth and then be impoverished. I mean, you're not going to get in quality facilities and it's going to jeopardize your quality of care. And before you go to the nursing home, every level of care short of the nursing home, you either better have a long-term care policy, which most people do not have, 
or you had better have access to resources. No resources, you're not getting those services. Exactly, but once you cross the threshold into nursing home care, then you are given a, you're given a number of choices. One of those is protected. And one of the challenges people say, well, I don't want to be in the Medicaid ward. Well, I walk through nursing homes a lot, and I haven't yet to find the Medicaid ward. Well, there's a reason, because federal law pro prohibits it, so there <laughs> exactly. is no such thing. Right. And the reality is, is the caregivers, the people where the rubber meets the road, don't care whether you're private pay or public pay. And so, you know, the, you know, the administration might care a little bit, but it has no impact on the quality of care that you receive. Exactly. If you go into a nursing home, you're going to be in the same beds, it's getting the same food and medications and treatment as anybody who's privately paying. So it, there is no problem. And so when we represent folks, we want them to be secure first. Secure means don't give away your money while you still need it to take care of yourself. Exactly. Once in a while, probably maybe three to five percent of the cases, we do pre-admissions transfer strategies. Mm -hmm. But that typically involves people with a lot of wealth. Yeah, a lot of wealth, big, illiquid assets. There's always unique situations. But for most people with a home and some money, it doesn't always make sense. So middle class couple, you know, with you know hundred thousand dollars in the bank and paid for house, we're not giving away anything until the first spouse we can protect it all, second spouse we can still protect fifty percent. If they start giving away stuff, they have fouled up the spousal rules completely and they put themselves at risk for not being able to take care of themselves. Yeah, that's the biggest challenge because if you've made transfers uh, in a, especially in a married couple situation, A, you may not get into a quality facility, or B, if you run out of money, you could still face a penalty. And oftentimes people say, well, the facility says I can't do Medicaid planning. That's barred by federal law. Exactly. You're allowed to do whatever law says, and no one can take those rights away. Thomas always thanks for taking time to appear on the program. You're welcome. More from Contemporary Retirement after these messages. Few things in life are as important as family. Leave your insurance worries to us, Wright Gardner. Call or visit our website to learn how we can make insurance simple and more affordable. Every life that meets its end leaves a heart for love to mend. Sister, brother, family, friends are left to carry on. When the loss seems more than you can bear, it's nice to know that we'll be there at Double Save by Call Ed Lowe to help put your mind at ease. Welcome to Special Guest Feature on Contemporary Retirement. This segment focuses on various issues which are of importance to the retirement community. With me today is County Executive Jan Gardner-Frederick. Welcome to the show, Jan. Thank you for having me. You know, good government in, at the county level in Frederick has had been a very interesting transition because you had a complete shift in the way government was administered in five, four years ago. Tell us a little about that. Well, in 2012, the citizens of Frederick County decided to go to charter government. So I am the first county executive in the history of the county, which means I have the management responsibility for all of county government, and county government is large. We have 17 divisions, 2,100 employees, and I also set the direction and vision for the county and represent the county outside of Frederick County, which includes the New York City bond rating agencies in Annapolis and Washington, D.C., and in a variety of other uh, forms. And of course the challenge in an elected role is, is that the previous methodology was part-time county commissioners trying to administer a very large county government. I do work full-time. In fact, it's required in the charter that the county executive works full-time for the county, has no other kind of employment to interfere with that. And so I, I'm on the job seven days a week, actually. Uh, there's always something happening in county government. We operate 24-7, and we provide for education, public safety, and a variety of other human services. And the county executive, as opposed to a town manager, there's a filter. The public can't hire and fire the, can't, the town manager because it no, goes through can't. county government. But you, in fact, do answer to the citizens. I do answer to the citizens of the public, and I'm certainly out and about all the time in Frederick County. It's a big uh, county, 
and I want to hear what people have to think and what they what they input they have about where Frederick County is going. Well, you and some private citizens embarked on a on a on a litigation which, while I generally don't like litigation, was incredibly important to the retirement community, and that was the previous administration made a decision to sell a county home to owned nursing home, which I'm not as passionate about as I am the low income assisted living, which was owned and really put a whole group of people at risk. Well, uh, the prior administration did decide to sell Citizens in Montevue. Citizens is our nursing home. Montevue is assisted living. And they do go together. And the county has um, had land called Montevue since 1828, and it was provided to the county for the benefit of the poor. So it was a lot of things over a lot of years. So when but the county took advantage of that property and built facilities on it, they subjected themselves to that restriction in the will. We did. And so selling it, I thought, was a violation of that co covenant and really a violation to the community. And citizens of Montevue have taken care care of residents in Frederick County for a long time. So and we're the, gonna bring some pictures up as we're talking about it. But the rea one of the things that was really critical was is it addressed the fact that the federal government in that benefits program does not provide any assistance for low-income people. It doesn't provide any assistance or funding for assisted living. So we do provide assisted living for seniors who have lived long enough to outlive their money and they need to be taken care of. They're not safe to live at home. And so we can really be proud in Frederick County that we provide that kind of care and assistance to our seniors. So we operate Citizens and Montevue in a financially self-sustaining manner. Citizens operates like any other nursing home, but we take the profit or revenue from the nursing home and we subsidize uh, citizens who need assisted living in Montevue. And we only provide that service to Frederick County residents. And so that facility, as people are looking at, is a beautiful new modern facility. It was reconstructed, and then the decision, which I felt was totally inappropriate to sell it, was made. And then you, and with the assistance of private citizens who paid for the litigation, stopped that, and now it's back the way it was originally intended. That's correct. And I think we're, not only did we go to court to retain those facilities, we saved seven and a half million dollars in the process because they were, had agreed to sell the buildings for less than we owed on them. And we also retained an important service for the citizens. And I think we can all be proud in Frederick County that we have this model of taking care of our citizens and our seniors in need and doing it in a financially responsible manner. And, and We've been passionate on this show for 20 years about the need to provide for assisted living for low-income people. It's not that they were irresponsible. They're just people out there that, you know, just got by their entire careers. There's nothing wrong. And they're entitled to have some opportunity to be safe and secure for the balance of their lives. I think that's absolutely true. And I am grateful that we had citizens in our community who felt it was so important that they were willing to go to court, which allowed me, when I became county executive, to continue that legal process to retain those facilities. Well, John, well, thank you for taking time to appear on the show. And I've always been very impressed with how you operated federal county, Frederick County government. Thank you very much. More from Contemporary Retirement after these messages. Tranquility at Fredericktown Assisted Living and Memory Care provides a warm, home-like atmosphere that promotes daily life enrichment. At Tranquility, our medical director is a geriatric physician. Our professionals support and understand the various stages associated with Alzheimer's and dementia. We have on-site physical, occupational, and speech therapists, as well as around-the-clock licensed nurses. For more information, give Tranquility at Fredericktown a call today, because everyone deserves great care. Let us do the caregiving, so you and your loved one can embrace life again. All right, let's get this show on the road. Ma'am, give me a good push. Hang on, just one minute. Ma'am, I, I need you to push right now. Honey, you really need oh, to it's push. Time. It's time. Just hold on a minute. No, right, right now, one push, ma'am, one push. Just one more bid on HurleyAuctions.com. If you haven't visited HurleyAuctions.com, you don't know what you're missing. Whether you're buying or selling, antique cars, tractors, boats, or real estate, you can do it all at HurleyAuctions.com. Get to know Dr. Carrie Hesley at Diagnostic Imaging Services. What I find most rewarding is caring for women through our Women's Imaging Center. We have a caring staff that will ease patients through an ultrasound, bone densitometry, breast biopsy, or mammogram. 
Our health team is sensitive to emotions involved in women's imaging and understands that every woman is at risk for breast cancer. Providing the community with a center that is so dedicated to breast health and the imaging needs of women is something special. DIS Women's Imaging Center, providing women with progressive care. Welcome to Contemporary Health Scene. Contemporary Health Scene focuses on the health issues affecting the retirement community. With me today is Dean Cook, co-facilitator of the Washington County Parkinson's Support Group. Welcome to the show, Dean. Thanks, Michael. It's good to be back. You know, Parkinson's has, a, unfortunately, a fairly wide swath across our society. Unfortunately, it does, and it continues to grow, Michael. I think it's estimated that there's about a one, uh, one million people in the United States now who have Parkinson's disease. And one of the interesting things about Parkinson's, it doesn't manifest itself just simply in the way that people used to think in terms of the tremors or so forth. It actually manifests itself a lot of different ways. There are so many different faces to Parkinson's disease. There's, there's the tremors, there's the freezing up, there's the speech impediment, there's stomach issues. Uh, there's just so many uh, different symptoms you can, you can have when you have Parkinson's disease. And sometimes Parkinson's in its early stages is not easy to diagnose. It's very difficult to diagnose. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in my own personal case, they had carpal tunnel surgery, cubital tunnel surgery. There's no blood test for it. There's just a physical exam, and sometimes it takes years to get it right. It also does mean many times it has a very long course of action as well from times where you maybe have minimal uh, you know, inability to, to function to very high levels. Absolutely. Some people go, uh, you, you manage the, uh, the disease is what you do. It's like diabetes, for example. Uh, you, some people have a long term. Michael J. Fox, for example, was diagnosed when he was 29 and now I think he's 50 years old. And so as you, as you look at this, part of what the support group does, and people need to understand, support group is not only about the person who is suffering from the affliction, but those people also have family members that are engaged in providing support for that person as well. And, and a lot of times people are essentially trying to invent the wheel when in fact there are people out there that have been through this course and can help them. A lot of our members actually uh, have spouses they've lost to Parkinson's disease and they keep coming to our uh, meetings and uh, they keep gaining information. It's a, it's a large community. It's not just the per person with Parkinson's, but you're absolutely right. It's the caregivers as well. And so your organization, besides having various support functions, also has a monthly meeting. Tell us a little bit about it. We meet the first Thursday of every month at the uh, Western Sizzlin Restaurant in, in, uh, in Hagerstown. Uh, the people there are great to give us the back room for our meetings. We uh, attract 50 to 60 people at every meeting. We have great speakers. We have lunch. Uh, we, it's really an uplifting experience for anyone in the Parkinson's community. And particularly, you know, you have both caregivers and you have people suffering from the affliction and it's always easier to be in an environment where you don't feel out of place. You know, I can't say enough about a support group. It's not only the one in Hagerstown, but we have one in Winchester, there's two in Frederick, there's one in, in uh, Chambersburg. And they all do great work and they bring these people together and it is exactly what it says it is. It's a support group where you can rely on other people to give advice and, and help you through uh, the, the journey, the Parkinson's journey, I'll put it that way. And so sometimes it can be as simple as perhaps providing an assistance on a mobility strategy or a medication administration strategy to actually talking about fairly complex issues as to courses of treatment. What we encourage our people to do is get to know each other. Medications are different, uh, their life experience is different, their doctors are different, and the more you know, the, the more information you gather, the better off you are. You can go to your doctor on your next visit and bring up a subject that you learned from, from somebody else. And part of it is, too, is that we see there's a lot of misinformation out there, you know, in terms of uh, people not being up to date on the latest treatments, uh, not uh, really understanding that, you know, some of these treatments have you know, consequences relative to other treatments and so you have people out there talking about what not only to do but what to be concerned about. And that's one of the reasons we bring in some of the best speakers around from Johns Hopkins. If you look at our uh, visitors list or guest speaker list from last year, we had three or four speakers from Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland. These are the top experts in the field and uh, they, they, that's where you get the best information. And of course, then talking about practical stuff, I know I speak at those things, and you know, people need to pay attention to their legal documents. They need to understand what the benefits programs are going to look like, and almost everything they've heard from friends, neighbors, and relatives is wrong. Well, you you you've been a speaker at our meetings quite a few times. We need to get you back, Michael, again. <laughs> but uh, you're absolutely right, and it's uh, people need to be aware of these long-term situations that they can get themselves into. 
All right, so if a, I, I know that your event is very open-armed, and it doesn't have to be a Washington County resident. Just anybody who wants to come can come, but how do they participate? Actually, uh, all you have to do is show up. Uh, we don't have, you don't have to give us any advance notice. Uh, uh, they can contact me if they want to, and I can give you my home f uh, phone number, which is 304-268-1623. If you need any information, we're more than happy to provide that to you. But just show up at the Western Sizzling Steakhouse at 12 o'clock on the first Thursday of every month, and you'll greet, meet a lot of great people. And get a lot of support. A lot of support. Dean, I want to thank you for taking time to appear on the program. Michael, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. More from Contemporary Retirement after these messages. The Community Foundation, through its scholarship programs and through its strategic grants, has been a positive influence for change. Last year, change in Frederick County was influenced thanks to nearly 1,800 caring donors. Everyone can help. Your influence is key. Help us proactively focus on where we need to be investing our energy in the future. Albright, Crumbacker, Mal, and Itell are a full-service firm that provides elder care services including managing incoming bills, bill payment, depositing checks, balancing bank statements, and preparing, planning, and filing personal tax returns. Put your mind at ease and call us today. Welcome to the Making Sense feature on Contemporary Retirement. Making Sense focuses on the financial issues affecting the retirement community. With me today is David Twen Hayfield, Senior Vice President of the Family Heritage Trust Company. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. You know, Dave, when you hear trust company, you automatically think that you have to have a trust. Yeah, people, I'm always disabusing people of that idea. The vast majority of our clients do not have money in a trust. It's just investment advisory, holding IRAs, but trusts are also a piece of the business. It's, it, we have a tool that a non-trust company doesn't have. We can serve as a trustee and we can do all of the other investments that, that any kind of investment management company will do. But you know, part of what we talk about here is when I talk to my retired clients, they're always very interested in being secure, that's easy, but they also want to avoid unnecessary risk. And what we see people every day is accepting risk in their portfolios that they have absolutely no idea that they're accepting that risk. So everybody, when you talk to them about the stock market, they immediately kind of knee-jerk and perceive it as you know, nothing but risk. It's like right. going to the casino and gambling which history says done appropriately, it's not. Well, the stock market on average goes up two days out of every three. So if you could go to a casino where you won two days out of every three, that might be fun to do. Yeah, but you do have to do it appropriately so that you can capture that when it happens. Because sometimes we see people's portfolios are just too narrow and they're at risk of not performing even though the market itself does perform. Well, a lot of people, even retirees, have a, they have a long-term investment horizon. Well, they might not think they do, but their money needs to last the rest of their life. They need the income to grow for the rest of their life. And when they have too much money on the fixed side, too much on the fixed side, they're at risk that they're not going to have enough money later in life. Well, let's talk about the fixed side means. What we're talking about is we see people with bond portfolios. Bonds. We see people with bond portfolios that don't pay taxes and they have municipal bonds and they think that somehow that is a benefit to them. But in reality, bonds have a, municipal bonds have a lower return than regular bonds and it only works if you have a high taxable income bracket. Yeah, and, and most people in retirement are not in high income tax brackets. So municipal bonds are often not the best way to, to handle the fixed side. And one of the problems we have with unintended risk is that many times people will look at a bond issued by a municipality and one of them is paying five and a half percent and one of them is paying three and a half percent and I oftentimes ask them do you have any idea why the same municipality has two different types of bonds and people never know why it is and the difference is one of them is you're invested in a parking deck right. and the other is you're invested on the tax receipts of the institution. Yeah, just because some things, they, they're not all made equal. Some are riskier than others. Um, some are, as they, they're called, revenue back, like the, like the parking garage. If there's not enough revenue, if people aren't using the parking garage, there's not enough money to pay the bondholders. And yet people won't, will look at that and not realize that one of them has substantially greater risk than the other, and they think they're the same. Yeah, it, it's an, and increasingly over the last few years, really the last five or ten years, I'm looking at people's portfolios of bonds or bond funds and they, they've been chasing high income and they have no idea how much more risk they've taken on. 
And bonds are valued on the basis of cash flow. And, and there's a famous Nobel Prize statement that's a prize winner statement that a bond that has a maturity in excess of five years has more risk than the stock market. Now, how could that be? Well, that's because as interest rates increase, and that's what's happening today, the value of the bond itself that you own is going to go down. And so over, if, if you look at, it's called the yield curve, a fancy, a fancy number, a fancy term that means the farther out you go, the higher the income. However, the farther up, but the rate at which the income goes up gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Beyond five years, you get very little extra income for owning a 15-year bond than you do for a five-year bond. And here's what happens. If the bond expectation rate is 4% and you have a $100,000 bond yielding 4%, that's $4,000. But if the expected yield goes to 6%, that's what everybody expects, and you only have a bond that's yielding $4,000, the value of that bond's going to drop to around $75,000. And people say, well, it's going to pay. Well, yeah, it will pay 15 years from now. But in the meantime, if you die during that time or you have to sell that bond during that time, you're actually going to have a loss, and people are shocked. Yeah, they are. They, they think bonds are safe, and safe is a relative term. So there's, it might not be safe in terms of you could lose principal. It might not be safe that your income's not keeping up with inflation. And, pe and people say, well, I don't, I just, I'll just buy U.S. government bonds. But actually, long-term U.S. government bonds sell on the same markets as any other bonds. And the reality is, is they're subject to uh, what we call rate risk anyway. Rates go up, the value of those bonds go down. Yes. and and. US government, U.S. government bonds are paying very little in the way of interest as it is. So if you're really interested in income, U.S. governments are not a, not a good place to look. So you help people, fee-based only, no charge to talk to you. What's the phone number? The phone number is 301-631-5900. Thanks for appearing on the program, Dave. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Thank you from Contemporary Retirement. Remember a more carefree time? Leave your insurance worries to us, Wright Gardner. Call or visit our website to learn how we can make insurance simple and more affordable. it seems like everything's online and filling out claim forms and receiving and paying bills online isn't always easiest. That's why we at Quality First Insurance encourage you to just give us a call. Let us help. Hi there. I'm Paul Sweeney with Quality First Insurance and it's still just this simple. Our offices are open every weekday where you'll be able to call and speak to real live people. No detail was missed. I'm so glad that I turned to Quality First Insurance. I've recommended Quality First Insurance to my friends who've been just as satisfied. If you're not happy with what you're paying for Medigap, or more importantly, not happy with your service, give us a try. We're locally owned, and we take the time to provide you with the best. We are Quality First Insurance, and our mission is to provide quality products to quality people. Pick up the phone and give us a call today at 800-745-1411.